Hi, Misha here. I'm kind of getting back to some videos after the holiday craziness and a little bout of illness. Nothing too big. But I wanted to show something I recently picked up. This is a set from Corgi. Typically they don't do a lot of sets, but this is one I've been wanting, but it's been sold out everywhere for a long time. We have a British Gloucester Meteor F1, or F Mark I. And I have other Meteors, quite a few actually, including an F3, which is pretty similar to an F1. But it's always neat to have the first variant. And it comes with this here. A German... Buzz Bomb. Doodle Bug. The V1. Or officially as it was known to the RLM and the Luftwaffe. The FI-103. The Feisler-103. This is a Pulse Jet powered guided cruise missile from World War II. It's a very interesting mix of technologies. Inside it's a very much a clockwork thing, almost a steampunk. But then it also had some very advanced tech like its pulse jet engine. An Argus Pulse jet engine. It was actually one of Germany's most effective kind of wonder weapons or crazy weapons from World War II. So I thought we would talk about it today. And I have another model here that's also another set from them that I've actually had for a little while since it came out. I've just been waiting to do a video on it. This is a Hinkle HE 111 with a Doodlebug V1 mounted under its wing, which was one of the two main delivery methods employed during 1944 and 1945. And uh, yeah, there's actually quite a bit to these. They uh, built over 30,000 launched nearly half of those with the main targets being London in the UK and of all things Antwerp this really is a flying bomb as it were it was not manned it had its own primitive autopilot it carried a thousand kilogram warhead had triple redundancy when it came to the detonators and while it used a pulse jet engine to save on cost and actually let this be quite an economic weapon it was made primarily of either wood or stamped sheet steel that was welded or in some instances riveted but mostly just kind of welded together because obviously these only made one flight and proved to be quite a horrific and effective weapon especially against the civilian populations and that's honestly where this meteor comes in to play because it was one of the most advanced ways Britain had in 1944 of countering this new threat because this was the first Allied jet which itself would serve all the way through Korea and beyond not this variant but later ones but I've done several videos on the meteor so this video is not going to be about it 
But it so it seemed unfair to not include it in its own set. <laughs> so it'll be here. And the same goes with the Hinkle 111. I'll just talk about how it relates to the Buzz Bomb today. And we'll get into German bombers probably pretty soon. So with that said, what about the history of this vengeance weapon? Well, just to give a really brief synopsis, the idea behind this goes all the way back to 1936-1937 to the Argus Corporation and a gentleman by the name of Fritz Guslaw or Goslaw. He was an early pioneer and proponent of remote control aircraft and Argus had already designed a couple for surveillance. And then in 1939, in November, the first proposal was given to the German RLM, essentially the Air Ministry for the Luftwaffe, for a remote-controlled flying bomb. It was supposed to have about a 300-mile range. It had two pulse jet engines designed by Argus. And it could carry up to a thousand kilogram warhead. Now this is an interesting time to propose anything to the German government because they were fresh off many victories in Poland and elsewhere. And at this time they felt the war would not last long. the next year, around April, Gosla kind of refined his proposal, kind of updated it, sent the updated version to the RLM. But really by May, they, they pretty much said they didn't see a military application. They just didn't have a need for it, and they were really concerned about the remote control aspect, the signal aspect. Basically, beam, beam guiding. They were afraid it could be jammed, interdicted, or even hijacked. So there wasn't a lot of progress or interest. But, Guslav, yeah, he believed in it. And Argus gave him enough latitude to keep working on his design. But the problem was, they were an engine and design bureau. They didn't really do fuselage in other parts of aircraft. Which meant a partner needed to be brought on board. And this is where Feisler comes in, famous for their Stork. Which is a pretty cool aircraft in its own right. Well, this is where the second made main contributor, Robert Lesser, comes in. He worked for Hinkle, who was an early pioneer of jet aircraft, but they were having some some hurdles, which I do cover in my ME262 and HE163, Hinkle 163 videos. So, in early 1942, Lesser went to work at Feisler. And then in February, he was made aware of this project. It had been known as Project 35, P-35 Erfurt, early on. And later in development, it would be operated under the codename Cherry Stone. Well, he took a look at the design, helped design the body. He also made a very important change. Went from two pulse jet engines to just one. Now this lowered the overall range, but it also, he lightened up the design, made it cheaper to produce. 
and they started to go away from the remote control idea to more of an independent autopilot onboard system. So they worked on the design pretty, pretty hot and heavy. At the beginning of June 1942, they give the design one more shot and they propose it to the RLM. Well, only about two, two and a half weeks later, not only do they come back with a yes for development as well as funding, because up to this point it's been pretty much a private venture, it ends up receiving a high priority, which means development from this point can progress quite rapidly because there's been a couple of years for the lead designers to really work on it. Now what changed? Well, 1939-1940, Germany is on an offensive war. They're on a winning streak. They don't think the war is going to go on by long. However, by 1942, that summer, eh, not so different. America's in the war. They're losing ground in North Africa. They lose the Battle of Kursk. Basically, Germany realizes that it's going to be fighting a much longer and more defensive war, and this is when Hitler's wonder weapons start to become important. So just a different mindset, and this kind of fit the, the bill better. Well, by the end of August, Feisler had the fuselage ready. And on October 28th, the first glide test was done, actually using a Focke-Wulf 200. And then on December 10th, 1942, the prototype FI-103V7 was first launched and powered and was directed to a general target. And it actually was uh, air launched from uh, a variant of this aircraft here, a Hankel 111 H variant, I believe. But yeah, the first full test launch of a, at that time, Cherry Stone <laughs> was from one of these. So, with success at the end of 1942, the production line was set up. Uh, development had already started at the Pinamunda West facility. So, kind of the adjunct of this, the Pinamunda that you're very familiar with. And it would continue through 1943. They would work on setting up production lines. And just as important, they would work on setting up launch sites for these. Because while... The air launch was the first proposal. What they ended up deciding to go with were short takeoff and landing. Or not landing. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, I'm exploding. Sorry, guys. A little tired. Uh, takeoff ramps. Initially to be powered by steam catapults, but soon to be powered by catapults with a T-stuff and Z-stuff reaction. Basically the same propellants used for the Messerschmitt 163 Comet. So either way, this would be basically assisted with the ramp takeoff, and so they had to establish sites and, of course, train crews and everything. And by November of 1943, the plans were far underway. And then by May June, they were pretty much ready to go. This was christened the Vengeance, or Vengeance Weapon 1, actually not by Hitler directly, it was uh, first used in a propaganda spin on the official newspaper of the Reich, but Hitler was very in favor and signed off on it, so you started to see the, the V1 name appear in June, and they were ready to go, and of course the invasion of Normandy, D-Day. The thing is, this had a relatively short range of about 160 miles, meaning the launch sites were located in France and other northern coast countries in Europe, occupied Europe. They were not to let a little thing like D-Day stop them from launching their new weapon. So 
So the first official V1 attacks were launched from the fixed sites established in northern France and the Dutch coast on June 13th. The first one hit London killing eight civilians and from there they would continue to ramp up attacks through the summer. At the peak the Germans were able to launch a hundred per day. What we have here is truly just a flying bomb. It's a little over 27 feet long. It's got about a 17 and a half foot wingspan including the pulse jet. It's a bit under 5 foot tall. It weighs a bit over 4,700 pounds. It carries 165 gallons of gasoline on board. It also has two air tanks for power and compressing the fuel. It took off at about 360 miles per hour and would typically cruise at 400 miles per hour. Now typically, well initially they were going to fly it at about eight to 9,000 feet, but they had some mechanical and functional issues, so they lowered the typical cruise height to two to 3,000 feet, which solved the issues, but did bring it within range of the AAA, the anti-aircraft guns, although it actually kind of flew in between the shorter range and the higher altitude guns, so it did kind of hit a little bit of a sweet spot where it wasn't perfectly vulnerable, but still was vulnerable. It was very affordable. It just had a thousand kilograms of pretty standard explosive in the nose. It took the same as German iron bombs, so nothing too revolutionary there. Its two main advanced pieces of tech were its Argus pulse jet engine, which would pulse about 50 times a second, giving it its distinctive sound of buzz bomb. And its autopilot, which was quite a mechanical achievement for that day, but totally analog, of course. Had all kinds of systems in there to determine different things. For example, there was a weighted pendulum. There was a, a magnetic compass. There was, of course, a gyroscope. And really what was used to determine to hit the target was the odometer. They would set it at a certain number and it would count down. And when it hit zero, it would automatically put the craft into a steep dive, hopefully hitting the target. They pretty much abandoned the idea of having this remote controlled, so of any tactical use, more to, you know, attack strategically like cities. So let's say, you know, wherever you're at, London's 150 miles away, you set the odometer to 150 miles, you fire it off, and then when it hits 150 miles, it dives and hits the target. This would explode on the surface, giving maximum damage to property and humans. It, um was uh, pretty advanced and pretty clever for what it was and also amazingly quite inexpensive for what it was. So they would first start using the 
round launch system, firing over 9,500 9, of these at England, basically London. I was going to say that when these first started off, their accuracy wasn't great. They could hit a circle with a diameter of about 19 miles. But as time would go on, they would improve this and narrow it down to almost 7 mile diameter. So, you know, getting better. But after they had the ground launch, the catapult, the ramp launch going, that's when uh, air launches came in. Starting in July of uh, 1944, the, uh, the Blitzwing, uh, brought Bomber Wing 3, flying the Hinkle 111H, would uh, take off and go through the North Sea, carrying one doodlebug. And uh, it would basically fly what they call the high, it's a low, high, low pattern. It would uh, dive low to wave top to avoid radar and whatnot, and det hopefully detection. It would go up to altitude to launch its doodlebug. And then it would go immediately low again and try to return home safely. A very dangerous mission, but it did give the extra range. It was just one more delivery system that didn't have the Germans dependent on their uh, fixed sites on the coast. Now, they didn't actually use near as many of these. In fact, they, they only fired a little under 1,200. But it was a supplement, meaning that uh, England got hit with about 11,000 doodlebugs, give or take. Now, of course, most did not make it because the British were not just going to take this lying down. No siree. By July, they had organized Operation Crossbow, which was a very concerted, very multi-pronged effort to intercept these little demons. And that's where the Meteor comes in. This was their brand new aircraft. One of the fastest in the fleet. They didn't have many of these, but by July they were starting to employ what they had in uh, anti-V1. And they only downed about 13 with the meteors, but considering how few meteors were there and how new they were, it's pretty good. The early F1 meteors also had a problem with their cannons jamming, but that's neither here nor there for this point. But many other aircraft were very successful. The Hawker Tempest was the most successful, destroying about 650. The Mosquito was kind of the second most successful, destroying over 600. From there, the newer Griffin-powered Spitfires, as well as P-51 Mustangs and some of the more speedy P-47M variants and others all shot their fair share down and they didn't just rely on aircraft to intercept these they also used barrage balloons along the coast these were only modestly effective they only downed a little over 300 the main thing is the Germans kind of anticipated this so they put wire cutter tips on the wings so these could fly through them basically they were only effective if the wires would catch more of the fuselage or the tail still 300 less hitting the cities on top of that they also of course used anti-aircraft guns and these were greatly assisted by a new analog computer system quickly developed and rushed over from America made by Bell Labs they really let them zero in on their targets, and of course they had radar. And by August, September, they were getting 75 to 80% of V1s before they either even reached London at all, or before they could detonate over a populated area. On top of that, they used misdirection via espionage and counter, you know, spies to kind of try to misdirect the targeting all in all, a very concerted effort. Only about 2,500 actually 
got to London. But unfortunately of those, they still managed to kill over 6,000 and injure nearly 18,000 people. And of those, most were innocent civilians because this would explode on the surface. It was, it was mostly going to go for civilians. And these were very good. If they did get to the ground, they were very good at exploding. They had a triple fuse system. They had an electrical fuse with a backup mechanical designed to detonate upon impact. And if for some reason both of those failed, there was a timer they would detonate a very short time after it hit the ground. This wasn't really meant as a terror weapon in that sense. I mean, the gun, the, the whole thing was. But the time fuse was more to keep these out of the hands of British intelligence, which it actually did a very good job of. They did not recover very many intact V1s, especially in 1944. However... Thankfully, by September, October, there started to be a respite from the B-1s because the advancing allies through Europe were basically taking over the launch sites. And by October, they had seized all of them in France and the nearby North countries. So for a time... The only V1s they had to contend with were the air-launched ones from the bomber wings. So, by the end of the year, London was mostly, mostly safe. And it also gave the Meteor its first real combat use and in a very noble role of saving lives. But of course, that was not, unfortunately, the end to the story at all. There would be a second chapter to the V1's Reign of Terror. So with all the um, sites in northern France and nearby seized, Germany still had V-1 sites on the Dutch coast, so Hitler ordered that their attacks be turned against the port city of Antwerp in Belgium, because this was a major access point for the Allies to get supplies on the continent. So, yeah, why not just terrorize them, since we can't terrorize the poor British civilians. Yeah. What a great guy. Anyway. So yeah, beginning in October of 1944, the remaining B-1 sites would target Antwerp and start firing and get quite intense around November and early December of that year. And they would launch nearly 2,500 with um, about 210, 211 actually hitting and doing uh, noticeable damage and uh, loss of life and even more destruction of property. There, the Allies didn't have the complete intact network of defenses like they did in the UK over in London. So they mostly relied on uh, searchlights, radar, and guns. Although towards the end, some meteors were rushed over. It's also worth pointing out that this whole time the Allies have been bombing the tar out of any V-1 production, assembly, storage, maintenance sites they could find, diverting a significant proportion of their uh, bomber forces to try to knock out Germany's stockpile and production ability. So, at the end of 1944, really the only V-1s were coming from these guys, the Hinkles. And in January of 1945, the, uh, the air launches would end. Uh, the Luftwaffe was just in complete disarray, um, lacking fuel. Even when they could get planes in the air, the Allies had such air superiority that 
it was just unlikely that a bomber like this could make it in back. And the success rate wasn't fantastic anyway. Only about 40% of the air launch B1s were making it anywhere near their targets. So, yeah. So, so we're pointing out by this point the Hinkle 111 was a, a very dated plane. Very slow compared to newer newer planes like the P-51. So yeah, that would end in January. So you would think England is safe, but in February, the Germans would introduce a long-range version of the V-1 named the F-1. Basically, it had a bigger fuel tank. It was made almost entirely of wood to save on weight and resources, and it was given a smaller warhead so it could have a longer range. So again, London was within range, just barely, and on March 2nd, Operation Zeppelin was carried out, where hundreds of F-1s were shot against London, and so the V-1 attacks would start up again in March of 1945, and all this while they were still being fired at Antwerp. Thankfully, this would not last that long. The last attack against London would happen on March 29th. This would actually be the final attack on British soil of the war. And then the final attack on Antwerp would happen on March 30th, when the last V-1 site on the Dutch coast was finally captured and out of commission. And that was pretty much it. The V-1 was not a player in the final month of the war. However, its technology did not end here. The pulse jet and the overall design would continue in some capacity, if nothing else, for study. I brought this out to show you. This is that uh, Hinkle 163, the Salamander. Notice a very distinctive design similarity with the single engine mounted above. Now this is not a pulse jet. This is a BMW. But it's a jet engine. Jet turbine. But the wings, the general over, you know, design kind of bullet head tip. In fact, the down sweep of the wings on this, the little, were only added at the end of development. So originally the wings came out very similar to the V1. Even size-wise, this is not just a ton bigger at all. See here? It's funny enough, they did propose a manned version of the V1, known as the Reichenberg. And even though they had volunteer pilots ready to essentially strap themselves into a bomb, they never actually used them. Instead, they kind of went this direction with the Volks aircraft here for the people. This is kind of what replaced it. It's not too far off from a flying bomb. At least it has landing gear, though. And an ejection seat, which is, you know, yeah, something. When I say flying bomb being piloted, you're probably thinking Japanese. Well, they did actually share the Argus engine and the technology behind the V-1 with the Japanese. In 1943, even shipping them components and parts and designs and even some specialists. And the Japanese did make a proposal. They did a design something known as the Cherry Blossom, which would have been an even more devastating kamikaze weapon, but thankfully it never got off the, the drawing board and went into production. Thankfully for everyone, the Japanese and the Americans, because it's just crazy. Of course, after the war, the Allies captured many V-1s in the production facility, and quite a bit of the Pinamunda facility. And uh, the U.S., France, and Russia in particular were interested in this. 
testing out a German examples and even building clones copies of their own. French seemed particularly taken with the idea of an unmanned remote or autopiloted vehicle. And there were some, you know, things and this and that, but basically none of that ever went into full scale production, but it, it was instrumental in that kind of late 40s, early uh, Cold War rocketry jet propulsion study. This ended up being the only aircraft, I think I said earlier, they went into production that had a pulse jet engine. But it doesn't mean its design and features and autopilot weren't used to advance technology on both sides of the Iron Curtain, because they certainly were. You know, a lot of people think of the V-2 rocket, but in most every way, this was a more successful, if not as glorious, weapon of war. It was far cheaper, far like 5% cost per unit to a V-2. It caused the Allies to divert up to 25% of their bomber attacks at one time to try to take it out. It rightfully scared the shit out of Londoners. It even had the buzz noise to let them know it was coming. So it had a very devastating psychological effect. And it had a real world effect. It destroyed uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of homes, bu buildings, warehouses. And like I said, basically 24,000 Londoners were either killed or injured. Not to mention those in Antwerp. And of course it also distracted the RAF's very latest uh, fighters taking them away. It really did tie up a lot of Allied resources and, and cost them. So it was one of those few times when German technology was not a detriment to them. <laughs> so it was respected by its opponents. Obviously, no one likes a bomb, but they had to respect the ingenuity and the effectiveness. And yeah, like I said, uh, nearly half of the 30,000 built were deployed, and most of them actually m made it or would have made it to their targets. They didn't have a high percentage of mechanical failures for what you'd think an early self-guiding cruise missile would have pretty successful frankly for that time and place but you know I thought this would be kind of a, a sl slightly different video it's been one I've been wanting to do since I picked this set up <clears throat> early this year when it came out and I'd pretty much given up hope finding uh, this one, it's been sold out everywhere for a long time, at least a year. And uh, for some reason, a little before Christmas, I just thought I'd check Amazon. And I've had very bad luck with Amazon, especially with Corgi. Even when I find nice, neat model sets on there, they're almost always just ridiculously overpriced. But uh, I looked, and this was there. They had like three left of the set. And they were fairly priced. In fact, they were lower than when they had been in stock at most American vendors. And that was the only catch. that This had to be imported from England. But I paid for the no-rush shipping, which was only like 8 $9. And it was due to come in on January 6th. But uh, it was a kind of neat surprise. It actually came in on December 26th, I believe. Which was cool, but also not cool because I was right in the middle of having my flu. So, didn't really get a lot of time to enjoy it other than just kind of unbox it and make sure it made it through uh, transport okay, which it did. The box was a little banged up on one side, but Corgi packs their stuff pretty well. Yeah, these are both 172 scale die cast. The Meteor, like... The other ones has a pilot, 
the cockpit doesn't open, which most corgis don't. Some do, but most don't. Comes with a perfectly good little stand. You can display it with gear up, gear down. It has the Pytot tube and engine intakes. Cannon has the early style cockpit. Early paint scheme. And it's pretty much all metal. The only plastic is the nozzles on the engines and the uh, the tail is uh I say that yeah the the back part of the tail where it's real thin and tapered is is plastic and one reason they do it aside from detail is for balance that means most of the weights up front keeping it very secure on the stand they do the same thing with their uh they're vampires. But yeah, it's pretty much all metal. What's cool is you and the Pytot tube is metal. <laughs> now the doodle bug is all plastic. But it is, as you see, come with the standard stand. It's very light. They did it, one, to get maximum detail. And to be fair, the original was made of wood. It'd be really cool if they'd made it out of wood. That would have been super neat, like a wood wings and then metal for the center part. But, you know, considering this was a set that was priced the same as a single Meteor. In fact, this was actually a little cheaper than the Meteors I've seen. I'm not going to complain. I was just happy they gave a stand. I think it would have been neat since this doesn't have landing gear. I mean, it just didn't. If they'd included like a little ramp, a little launch ramp instead of a stand, but you know, hey, I don't know, just kind of using the one that um, came with the Hinkle. It just pegs under the wing, very similar to the other one. You can pull it off if you want, but if you do, there's really nowhere else to display it. And uh, yeah, the guns move on this. The machine guns and the bomb bays open. And it has gear up or down too. But I'll do a video on the Hinkle. And of course this is just a. This is actually. I've got a couple of salamanders. This is my. Uh, I can't remember if it's my Oxford or my Atlas. But I think it's a neat little plane. But yeah. The V1. Cruise Missile, Flying Bomb, Doodlebug, Buzz Bomb, Vengeance Weapon. Hope you enjoyed this. If you have any uh, questions or comments, please do post them below. And if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And I'll give you two guesses which video is probably coming next or very soon after this one. <laughs> If you've seen my NASA videos, it's probably not a big guess. <laughs> well, this is Misha. It's late. I'm going to turn in. Hope you guys had a good holiday season. Happy New Year and all that good stuff. I'll catch you very soon. Next time.